Hola, bienvenidos a Diálogos, soy Facundo Guadaño, me encuentro con Quentin Skinner, un reconocido historiador de Cambridge, básicamente eh, uno de los fundadores este, de la llamada Escuela de Cambridge, de, del pensamiento político, es un honor tenerlo dentro de este programa, dentro de Diálogos, eh, intentando recorrer su obra, intentando... Eh, llegar hacia lo profundo de la misma fuera de los teóricos de la de los teóricos tiempos de la industria cultural. So, hello Quentin, how are you? Well, um, I'm very well and I'm very honored to be invited and thank you very much indeed. And may I, before we say any more, also thank you for allowing you to use my own language. This is an amazing privilege, and it's one that the Anglophones just must not take for granted. Well, actually, uh, in the, you, you are the first in our program that is, uh, that is an Anglophone. And in our program, we uh, try to um, explore, to examine the whole uh, bibliography, the whole work of an author. And your work is actually... Um, It's actually huge, so we're going to take some time to examine it. But I would like to start with one of the fundamental topics when practicing an academic discipline, and it's the epistemological framework. I would like to be able to define yours, the changes it had over time, and how you currently approach an academic work uh, right now. Yes. I speak then as an intellectual historian, that's to say I'm mainly an historian of philosophy, but to some extent also an historian of literature and of art. And so I'm someone who's concerned with interpreting texts, but also explaining beliefs. And I, I do agree with you that there are certain epistemological issues that do arise in both of those cases. So maybe I'll take them in turn. Uh, first, the point about explaining beliefs. Well, this is going to be something extremely familiar to you yourself as an anthropologist. But historians, certainly when I was first training as an historian, this was absolutely usual, though less so now, used to assume that we should start by asking about the beliefs we're seeking to explain whether or not they are true beliefs. So, I mean, to take an anthropological example, there was an enormous literature um, on witchcraft beliefs. And this proceeded, uh, epistemologically speaking, as follows. You would say, well, first of all, <laughs> there are no witches. And so anyone who holds witchcraft beliefs um, has false beliefs. And so the question for the historian is, Since a false belief implies a lapse of reasoning, what was the cause of the lapse of reasoning? And so there is, if you like, the epistemology of the history. And what I wanted to say um, at the time, of course, you would not need to say it nearly so emphatically now, and you're quite right that we should be talking about the evolution of one's thinking here, is that to ask questions about truth in that way as an historian is just fatal to good historical practice. Historians should not ask about the truth of beliefs. They should only ask, was it rational for that person at the time to hold that belief? And unless you make that your question, you get no access to their mental world. You simply impose your own mental world on it. And I think that when I eventually wrote quite a lot about this, I was somewhat influenced by my friend Richard Rorty, who, of course, in his book, Philosophy in the Mirror of Nature, had adopted what seemed to me exactly the right view for the historian to adopt, taking the famous example of um, Galileo's dispute with Bellarmine about the Copernican hypothesis. He defied the reader to find it more rational to accept Galileo's prescription than to accept Bellarmine's. They both are part of a, a system of beliefs. They're both supported by evidence. They're both susceptible of argument. So you can't identify um, what needs to be explained about Bellarmine's belief by starting by saying, well, he got it wrong. Um, 
And of course, then you tend to psychologize. You think, well, what prevented him from seeing the truth? All of that way of thinking, much less common than it used to be, is something which, epistemologically speaking, I think is fatal uh, in historical practice. But then, if I could go on, there's also an epistemological issue I would want to raise about interpreting texts. And especially in the case of someone like me who's interested in moral, social, political philosophy, texts in those aspects of philosophy. And here the, the epistemological point I would want to make is you really cannot make and should not try to make any kind of a categorical distinction between philosophy and ideology. And I would want to say, and this speaks to my current practice, that even the most abstract philosophical texts are always interventions in debates and should be approached as interventions. Uh, I mean, of course, they're explications of concepts, but this is a Nietzschean point I'm trying to make, which is concepts are also tools, or as Nietzsche preferred to say, they're weapons. They're part of a war. Um, and the, the concepts that we have are a kind of frozen conflict. I mean, this is Nietzsche in the genealogy of morals. Um, so the philosopher is not someone whose analysis is above the battle. It's a contribution to the battle. The battle is all there is. And I think that's a very important point for historians of ideas to bear in mind. And so to, to try to answer the far last part of, of your question, if you ask me how now I would currently approach the study of a work of philosophy, I would say my first question is always, how am I going to identify what intervention this is making? What, what kind of an intervention have we got here? Now, of course, you may find you can't answer that. I mean, in some ancient philosophy, I think the means to answer those questions have probably been lost. But for me, that would be to say they can't be interpreted. Well, I, I think that the, the conversation is going to by, by two different ways. That is, one, uh, the changes you, you had, because I, I, I can't think that you always uh, been an an Nietzschean uh, in your epistemological framework and your approach to history. Maybe you had... Uh, Marxist or he Hegelian approaches and you um, uh, just uh, took that away from your thought or maybe that was something secondary but uh, also I would like to know what other philosophical tra traditions uh, helped you to be uh, the, the scholar that you are now yes Certainly, I want to say, first of all, not Marxist traditions. I think I was always a Nietzschean in the sense that, you know, we all read The Genealogy of Morality, and it's an extraordinarily striking work of history. Um, the work I did on ideology was quite confessedly anti-Marxist in the 1960s and 70s, which was the high tide of Marxism um, in English historiography, and I thought was causing um, the study of philosophy to get sidelined because it was seen as an epiphenomenon of um, other and more real um, historical processes. Uh, and I wrote quite a bit about how, even if it were the case that people's professed beliefs were um, causally explicable by other means, that could not mean that they should be excluded from historical explanation. On the contrary, you want an account of how that served to legitimize and legitimizing, of course, in, uh, it, it is uh, a condition usually of being able to do anything. So if I were to speak more positively, um, I think there were two main philosophical traditions that influenced me when I was first setting out, uh, and um, they've continued to be important to me. And one is a kind of idealist tradition in philosophy, which I associate in the English tradition with the name of R.G. Collingwood and especially his idea of history, book 1946. But behind him, the great figure of Benedetto Croce, especially the Teoria della Storiografia of the 1920s. What they have in common, and which Collingwood is to some degree taking from Croce, is that philosophy should never be thought of as a discipline which is distinguished by asking a certain set of questions. On the contrary, uh, in philosophy, the questions change all the time. And the answers 
change, partly because the questions change. They're not rival answers to one question. You should think of the interpretive task, therefore, as recovering the specific question to which you can think of the text as an answer. And when Collingwood eventually wrote his autobiography, he had a wonderful chapter called The Logic of Question and Answer, which was an attack on Russell's logic, but it was saying, Logic is not propositional. It is to do with question answering. And a good answer supposes that you've got the right question. So that was very important for me. What, what is the precise question that's at issue in some philosophical debate? But far more important for me and for my generation, and perhaps especially in Cambridge, was the enormous brooding presence of Wittgenstein, who had died in 1951, and of course, I went to Cambridge as a student in 1959. The Philosophical Investigations, his late masterpiece, was not published until 1953. And we were all reading Wittgenstein as students. And I think that in the group that I was in, we mainly treated Wittgenstein's work uh, in the investigations as an investigation of meaning. And the paradox was that what Wittgenstein seemed to be telling us in that work was don't ask about meanings in interpretation of utterances, um, ask about the use of concepts. So you talk about use instead of ask, uh, asking about meaning. You could expand that, as Wittgensteinians did, and especially Austin and Searle, into saying really we should think as interpreters of there being two dimensions of language. I mean, obviously there's the traditional dimension of meaning, but there's also, not just um, meaning things, but what, what are you doing? Uh, language is also social action. And so, as well as questions about meaning, there are questions about what you're doing. What are you doing in saying what you are saying? And the point for the historian here, or the cultural studies more generally, is um, focus on what texts are doing. So, uh, I don't know, let me take an example from someone I wrote about in this way, Thomas Hobbes, the English philosopher, writing um, about how to think about the theory of freedom. So he defines freedom as absence of impediments. That's what he says, freedom is the absence of impediments. So now ask, well, what's he doing in saying this? Um, Who is he challenging? What cause is he promoting? Where does he stand in a debate about this? what's his contribution to that debate? So we come back to the notion of an intervention. But notice that um, philosophically speaking, and this is the Wittgensteinian thought, what you're trying to get at is underlying intentions and purposes. And to use a more suspicious hermeneutic, the question is, what is this text up to? What, what's it doing? What's, it, what's the intervention? And that became a kind of slogan of the so-called Cambridge School, Ideas in Context, but it's a Wittgensteinian thought. Well, I, I, I understand that you uh, try to uh, understand the text, but from an ontological point of view, uh, do you see the society as a text? I'm actually saying that if, if you, I'm actually asking if you had uh, any hermeneutical uh, influence uh, because it, it's it's really related uh, Hans George uh, Gadamer Paul yeah. Rieger, yes you had yeah. that that influence yes well um, Gadamer's text was important uh, to me later it was not translated until 1960 uh, um, Fahid und Method um, but of course it's a very Wittgensteinian text uh, and so um, it, when I read it, as, as I did subsequently, um, it, it didn't surprise me as much as it, it should have done, perhaps, because um, I felt, yes, um, this is a tradition that I have already come to terms with through reading Wittgenstein. Recur was another matter, um, uh, and I, I found that when I subsequently engaged with Recur's work, um, I was more critical of it, uh, um, but not perhaps in a very interesting way, except that I was more than more interested than he was in questions about the recovery of underlying intentions. He had this idea of what he called surplus meaning in his, his hermeneutics, so that 
the, the meanings of text got separated from the writers of those texts, a very standard move in French post-structuralism. And I was always extremely opposed to that because it seemed to me that if what we're trying to offer is the interpretation of a text, then that is authorial. And I found myself at loggerheads um, with French post-structuralists over that issue, where I thought that the view that the reason we shouldn't be seeking to recover intentions and purposes is that they are irrecoverable. That was simply a mistake. Yeah, but um, what I was thinking is that, um, well, uh, if, if you had this her hermeneutical, hermeneutical thought, um, what kind of uh, approach do, do you have to history uh, when, when it comes to uh, laws in 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 terms of if it if it's possible or if it's desirable to have any kind of predictability of uh, of seeing you know the, the, there's a lot of uh, school of thought that uh, actually um, advocate for uh, laws and also or, or patterns of predictability uh, on history and I think that that is not your case. So I would like to know uh, more of your thought about uh, this uh, issue. Yes, those questions about whether um, history was susceptible of covering law explanations was, of course, very important at the time that I was starting out. Um, uh, but of course, the hermeneutic tradition was critical of that. The question as to whether there are law-like explanations of historical processes uh, is not one that professionally engages the historian of philosophy at all. I mean, this would engage economic historians and social mm -hmm. historians, uh, because there it looks as if there might be promising answers um, in the affirmative. But the, the question doesn't arise for historians of philosophy. Hmm. Okay, so, so oh, oh, you think that uh, laws and patterns are possible in, you know, in a different uh, practice of history, but in not uh, intellectual or, or uh, history of thought? I wouldn't even like to be very optimistic about the notion of general covering laws, uh, which are grounded simply on historical evidence. Uh, I mean, for the formation of a law, you would normally want counterfactual conditions as well as factual conditions. And these you're not going to get from the historical process. So I suppose I'm a skeptic about the whole, the whole project. But that's not a professional comment, because as an historian of philosophy, uh, these are not questions that arise at all. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, uh, going deep into your work, uh, I recognize the enormous work that is Visions of Politics, Volume 2, However, I must dive into the universe of criticism to be able to enter to an enriching dialogue with you, the author. And the main thesis of the second, the second volume indicates that indeed there were pre-humanists who advocated popular so sovereign sovereignty. However, some historians such as Mark Yurdevich point out that this was already the case in the Signori or Signoria and the properties by which Prehumanists are defined do not necessarily respond to republicanism since there is no systematic theorization of it. So I would like um, a reflection of you about this comment. Yes, that's, well, that's a large historical question. Um, I should start by saying that my studies of the writers whom I called prehumanists uh, in my book, The Foundations of Modern Political Thought. Uh, were written against an histori a historiographical background in which the republicanism of the Renaissance, the republicanism that you find in Machiavelli's Discorsi or in Guicciardini, um, was taken to be um, originally an early 15th century phenomenon. This was the thesis of a then very influential book by Hans Baron called The Crisis of the Early Renaissance, published in um, as early as 1955, but also very importantly, Pocock's book, The Machiavellian Moment, published in 1975. And my book was published in 1978. So there was a background in which 
um, humanist republicanism meant 15th century republicanism and especially the Florentine story and culminating in Machiavelli. So what I tried to point out in my Foundations of Modern Political Thought was, I mean, first of all, something very important about the political history of um, medieval Italy, which is that in Lombardy and especially in Tuscany, self-governing republics, city republics, comune, self-governing city republics ruled by elective officials operating within the bounds of written constitutions, these were phenomena of the 12th century. Uh, in Florence, in Pisa, in Arezzo, in Siena, this was the form of government. Um, my second point in my book was that, of course, these forms of self-government um, were legitimized in a theoretical literature of the 13th century, such texts as Giovanni di Vaterbo, um, the De Regimini, Principatum, uh, Civitatum, or Brunetti Latini, the most important, uh, writing in Romance, the Le Livre du Trésor, on the government of cities. So there was a pre humanist literature theorizing pre humanist uh, commune. Uh, Georgievich, if, of course, um, talking about uh, the seniorates, but the seniorates post dated the period that I'm talking about. Now, as to whether to pick up your other point from his critique, um, this is a systematic theorizing of Republican arrangements. Well, I, I don't know how systematic you'd expect it to be. I mean, the 1310 Constitution of Siena in its modern printed edition is two very large volumes. I mean, there's a complete explication of how to run uh, an elective system of self-government. And of course, if you then reflect on the fact that they never lost contact with the Roman um, moral and political writers, never lost touch with Cicero, nor with some of the historians, never lost touch with Sallust, then there is a way of theorizing a republic which they simply take from those Roman sources. And it is quite systematic. It gives you an account of the goal of the state, the goal of, of greatness and glory. Um, it insists in Ciceronian terms that that requires uh, uh, concordia ordinum, that requires peace and concord. That can only be achieved by the pursuit of the common good. That can in turn only be achieved by exiling and disenfranchising the aristocracy, making it a kind of bourgeois republic, and that it should be a, a republic governed by the virtues. So there's a Salast and Cicero story which recurs in all these texts, it's quite a systematic theorizing of republicanism. Uh, and my point is that it massively predates the full classical rapprochement, uh, which we find in the Quattrocento. Well, you actually uh, do in a, in, 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 in a lecture of yours, uh, some kind of division uh, between republic and some kind of uh, populist uh, concept of uh, social or organization. And I will, I will let you know if you actually uh, think of populism in a negative way, in this uh, uh, way of um, sovereign, sovereignty and yeah. social organization. Yes. The writers whom I was talking about um, talk about the the res publica, and they talk about the commune. And they wouldn't use phrases like popular sovereignty, after all they're writing in Latin, um, but they think that the, the ruler of the commune must be the, the populace, represented of course. Uh, it cannot be the whole populace, these, even these cities are much too large for that. that there must be a representative system of self-government. And uh, they wouldn't use the word sovereignty. I mean, that would have to be imperium um, in Latin. Um, but they do believe that not merum imperium, which they would think applies only to the Holy Roman Emperor, but they do think that the commune have imperium. That's to say they can legislate for themselves. 
and no one can challenge that legislation insofar as it applies to the Comune. And so um, it would be anachronistic to call that a theory of popular sovereignty, but it's certainly a view of the people as being the wielders of imperium. Well, well, yes, I, I, I was actually referring to some words that you used in the lecture, genealogy of the state. And, oh, yeah, yes. Uh, so so I, I was thinking of, of that kind of populism. And in a, in a history of that concept, and, and of course it's genealogical, um, there is some uh, negative concept of pop populism, and I, uh, and I must... Yeah. Uh, uh, recall Gianfranco Pasquino that uh, says that actually every uh, every state is populist because every state has the sovereignty of the of the of the people so there, there's always uh, populism but uh, in some uh, scholar scholarship discussion uh, there is this thing like uh, populism as a substantial thing uh, that is negative or positive and is that kind of division. So that was uh, my, um, that was the direction of the question. If you yeah. see this uh, sovereignty uh, as a, uh, some kind of pre-populism and if you uh, consider it negative or positive in this terms of this uh, scholarship this discussion. Yes. Well, it's a very important early discussion of the idea that imperium does not have to be regal. It is the, the earliest such discussion. And I would certainly want to say um, that the idea that uh, sovereignty is always popular sovereignty uh, doesn't apply to the historical period that we are now talking about. It would simply be absurd to say that. Because uh, in the constitution of the Holy Roman Empire, Merum Imperium is wielded only by the figure of the emperor. He alone has the right to speak in the name of the state and his will is the law. So it is arbitrary power. That is a form of sovereignty which runs through the European tradition. I mean, after all, that would be how the French would have thought of themselves in the 17th century. The will of the king is the will of the state and the, the people are subject to that will. So it's a protest against that view. And it becomes very much more important, of course, in the later 14th century, when the legal theory of corporations is brought to bear on it by writers like Bartolus, where the question becomes, who is the agent of the state? Because the, the idea of the state as the name of a fictional person, as a corporation, um, which cannot speak, but is nevertheless the owner of sovereignty. And there is a representative who speaks in the name of the state. That is a quite different theory. Um, and there, of course, it could be that uh, a single sovereign can speak in the name of the state or the people can speak in the name of the state. Uh, but that would be a completely different theory and not one that was available to the writers whom I'm talking about. Well, uh, doing this concept of, uh, of state, uh operative um, in, in, in terms of, of doing this um, this concept uh, in a way operation uh, in a way of uh, try to uh, see this concept uh, do you still think in the state uh, in a in a in a genealogical way in a in a in a, in a way that it's uh, constantly being uh, thought that is constantly being constructed because I when when I when, when I uh, saw when when I when I heard your lecture about the state it kind of uh, had some Hegelian re reminiscences of the state being constructed in the in a in a subjective way uh, by the individuals not only yeah. by the head of, not, not only by the head of, of the state that is of course important but by the individuals and it's not a static concept so uh, how do you think the state today do, do you think that has some properties that that are static 
or do you think that it's a concept that it's, it, it's constantly uh, moving and it's being uh, thought uh, again and again? Well, I think that genealogy is the only way to answer that question, as you imply. What I'm struck by in contemporary debates in political science about the concept of the state is that we are living in a, a kind of a post-Weberian uh, mm -hmm. setup in which no strong distinction is made between the state and the government. And it's, as it were, an empirical view of the state. The state is the name of the apparatus of power that has a monopoly of force over a particular territory. So there's something like a Weberian definition of the state. And there's a genealogy of that way of thinking about the state. And when people now talk about the state, they usually mean the government. But in a genealogy, you would have to take note of the fact that that has caused to be set aside a completely different way of thinking about the concept of the state, which is to say that the state is the name of a fictional person, which is the uh, holder of sovereignty, but which cannot act except when it is represented. But the question there is, who is the representative of the state? Because that will be the name of the person who wields sovereign power. But that power will be wielded in the name of the state. And that's the concept which we have tended to set aside. That's the Hegelian way of thinking about the state, obviously. Mm -hmm. So you're currently thinking in, in, in the state, uh, sorry, about, about the state in a, a post Bavarian way. Do, do, do you think that kind, that kind of approach to the state is actually outdated? I think that we've lost something in equating state with government and simply talking about the state as an apparatus of power. That's what tends to happen in political science now. And I think that the reason for wanting to approach this genealogically is to ask, how did it come about that a completely alternative way of thinking about state power in relation to power of governments um, got set aside. And the answer was that they wanted to make a distinction between legitimate powers of states and potentially illegitimate powers of government. And we've abolished that distinction. Mm -hmm. Well, in a, in a book of yours, Ambrogio Lorenzetti, the artist, oh, yes. uh, yeah, yeah. The, yes. the artist is a political philosopher. Well, it's a fa fascinating book, and uh, we not only see a work of high erudition, but also kind of attack on the consensus of with the good government of Lorenz City will not have, as is believed, Aristotelian Thomistic basis, but rather the root of this thought will be in Italian pre-humanism, which, which was based in Cicero and Sinise. I would mm. like to know how how you arrived at this hypothesis and the method methodological work that involved refuting a consensus regarding Lawrence City. You're very well informed uh, that, <laughs> um, uh, that as a book that, that exists, uh, doesn't exist in English because I published it as a series of essays in one of the volumes of my Visions of Politics book. But I did indeed publish a book about this great political painting. It is the most important political painting of the early Renaissance in Italy in the Palazzo Pubblico in Siena, um, painted in the late 1330s. And this enormous northern wall is a depiction of the cardinal virtues, surrounding, by the way, the persona civitatis, surrounding the symbolic figure of the person of the state, that's to say the city of Siena. Siena is the judge of the Sienese, that's what makes the state legitimate. Um, so, uh, well, the answer to your question is that in classical discussion of the, the virtues, justice, temperance, prudence, um, and fortitude, those are the four cardinal virtues, they all have a classical iconography. Um, so, for example, temperance is associated with, with tempering, uh, and she usually has two jugs. She's, she's, she's watering wine. She's making it more temperate. And prudence is usually shown looking both ways. Prudence is the person who knows how to act in the future because of understanding the past, and so on. So there are established iconographies. 
But what I noticed in looking at the pre-humanist writers was that one of them, the most important, uh, the, the most widely read, Brunetti Latini, the Livre du Trésor, he has this discussion on the government of cities. He has his own iconography. Of prudence, for example, he says, well, prudence carries a lamp to light the way to all the other virtues. Now, Lorenzetti shows prudence carrying a lamp. Um, Latini also says, well, temperance, it's not a quality of tempering, it's a quality of timeliness. And so Lorenzetti shows temperance holding an hourglass, a clock. Um, furthermore, Latini says, we can associate the cardinal virtues with precious stones. They're precious, the virtues, and so they're like precious stones. So fortitude is like a diamond. Lorenzetti shows the figure of fortitude, the huge diamond on her breast. And uh, Latini says, uh, justice uh, is like an emerald. Uh, and of course, an emerald is green. And Lorenzetti shows the figure of justice entirely dressed in green. Now, what I'm saying is the entire portrayal of the virtues in Lorenzetti's great work that are taken from one specific text. Uh, they're taken from Latini. And that provides the whole program. That was my contribution to the discussion. There's a program for this fresco cycle, and it comes from a particular text, and this is the text. And nor should that surprise you, because Latini, who was uh, Dante's teacher, of course, was one of the, the great pre-humanists of the late Trecento period, and would have been, his tresor would have been taught in the studium in the early 14th century. It would have been, it was the most widely circulating encyclopedia of the Trecento. So it's not at all surprising as the source. But my point was, um, if you wish to understand where this set of ideas comes from, it comes from one particular text. Well, uh, actually, there's a book that is fundamental to comprehend uh, your whole, uh, well, well not your whole, but as an introduction, at least for Quentin Skinner, that is Liberty Before Liberalism. And it's a book that I actually read a lot. And there's a paragraph that picked my interest, my interest considerably, and I had to read it. That, and it says, uh, uh, the, co the coherence of the neo-Roman theory of free cities and free states which was later overshadowed by the liberal analysis of freedom, considering it as the absence of coercion. This is, for me, fundamental in this book. So I would like your reflection on these two vision, visions of freedom and with all possible nuances and with the danger of incurring in an anachronism, which one do you consider applicable to a modern society? Because Freedom, it, it's still a, a problematic uh, word. Yeah. Thank you. You, you. you pass from a book of mine which has not been very widely read to one which I think is in about 20 languages by now, mm -hmm. the little book called Liberty Before Liberalism. Uh, it's in Spanish, I think, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. yes. Um, so... Uh, Yes, uh, th that is a book I would be delighted to talk about. Um, well, of course, I give you a piece of advice as a younger scholar. If you want people to read your books, keep them very short. Shorter books have more readers. <laughs> well, it, well I, I talk a book. It is actually a short book. I talk about something, as you say, called a neo-Roman vision of freedom. And I, I call it neo-Roman uh, not Republican, uh, because it was held by many people who were not Republicans at all. Um, it comes from Roman law. And then it passes into common law, and thus into the Anglophone tradition, Anglo-American way of thinking about law. And what I'm calling the Neo-Roman view of freedom was more or less unquestioned in legal jurisdictions up until modern times. So let me say a word about the Roman law, um, which is the source for this way of thinking about freedom. And everybody cited it. Um, 
the, the Roman law, the digest of Roman law, begins by saying, well, the law is about um, persons or goods. And so we have to start by asking about persons. And so the Roman law begins, de personis. And the first thing it said is, right, well, there are two types of persons. You can be a free person, a liber homo, homo, of course, meaning man or woman, or you can be a slave, service. Now, that distinction, of course, is vital in an ancient system of law because Rome is a slave society and slaves are outside the law. So it's crucial to know what is a slave because then that, that mm -hmm. is a category not going to be considered. Well, a slave is said to be someone who is subjectum dominio, someone who is in subjection to the power and hence to the will of somebody else. So a liberal, a free person, therefore, if everyone is either a slave or a free person, must be someone who is not subject to the mere will and power of anyone else, but is able, on the contrary, to act according to their own will, and is thus able, as the law says, vivere libet, to live as they wish. So liberty is defined as not being subject to the will of anyone else, but subject only to your own will. So notice here, freedom is defined as having a certain status. Um, you're able to act according to your autonomous will because you are not subject to the will of anyone else. Now, at some stage in modern Western political philosophy, that gets replaced, more or less replaced, by a different analysis. And that different analysis says, no, 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 to be free is to have choices. And so liberty is just not being hindered in your choices, which is what modern liberal discussion of what is freedom. Freedom is not being interfered with. I mean, that would be the foundation in contemporary Anglophone political philosophy for the entire discussion. What is it to be free? It is not to be interfered with. And so, um, they want to say, well, as for this other view, it's confused because it is saying you are unfree if someone could interfere. But we're saying, look, if, if no one is interfering with you, that's what freedom is. And so there are the two views and one more or less replaced the other. It's very hard to find anyone. I've never found anyone um, in the Renaissance period or before uh, doubting that what it is to be a free person is not to be subject to the will of another. And it would be very hard to find a 20th century work of political philosophy in the Anglophone tradition that didn't say the opposite, that would, that would say anything except freedom is absence of interference. Yes, but it, so as you say, sorry, yes, go on. Yes, but, but it seems that when you're speaking of the liberal analysis of freedom, it kind of has a negative, um, yeah quality of it and if you like preferring in some way uh, the coherence of the neo-Roman theory of free cities and it, it, it in a in such a way you 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 think of this uh, liberal analysis of freedom so uh, considering is an absence of coercion like a really uh, a poor thought as a, a really plain thought that's yes. my conjecture. Yes, that is true. Uh, I, I think that, um, again, we're talking in genealogical terms. I think that we've gone the wrong way. Just as I think we've gone the wrong way in our theory of the state, I think we've gone the wrong way in our theory of liberty. We've given up the theory that we ought to have held on to. And it would be very, very deep question for the historian of philosophy to say, well, why did we give this idea up? And the answer, I think, is it was asking too much. So we, we gave it up for thoroughly ideological reasons. But yes, we, we've got the wrong view of liberty. And that is uh, one of my fundamental claims in that book. What have we given up? Um, well, the, we've given up the idea that you are now an un, unfree if someone has the power to intervene to change your life. That's to say, they don't actually have to do it. But if, if there's someone who has the power 
to intervene against your will and change your life, you are now unfree. That's what we've given up. We've given up the idea in consequence of which we treat people as free people. We say that they're perfectly at liberty who are at the mercy of others. And so if you take the case of, I mean, the, the distressingly common case of um, disparate economic dependence of women on men, then the, the standard liberal answer is, well, you know, they're, they're free to leave. They, they don't, no one's stopping them from leaving. Or what about deunionized workforces who are at the mercy of their employer? Or worse still, uh, undocumented aliens who have a job and are completely at the mercy of their employer, and that affects their wages. Um, are they wholly free? Are they free agents? Uh, or are they subject to somebody else's will in such a way that there are things they just dare not say or could not fail to say? So you... What about... What about, just let me have one other example, which suddenly seems to me really important. What about the media companies? What about the fact that they hold huge swathes of personal data about people for undisclosed purposes? We're in their power. We're at their mercy. Uh, this gets discussed as a problem about privacy. But on my account, it's a problem about our liberty. I mean, why are we enslaving ourselves? So this, all of this we've given up. We say, well, we, we don't see these as problems of freedom. But they are. So you're saying that um, the liberal anal an analysis that is uh, absence of coercion uh, implies this uh, some sort of uh, voluntary, uh, in an abstract way, of course, uh, framework of free people that uh, organize uh, in terms of prices in terms of free contracts and yeah. that is the the tradition that we approach by yes, uh, yes absolutely um, our view would be of a contract a contract is free unless it's coercive and on the alternative view um, a contract which leaves you at the mercy of somebody else is not a free contract because it cannot fail to affect your conduct that you are now at the mercy of somebody else. I mean, for example, you won't dare um, criticize them. There are lots of things you won't feel able to say. There are lots of things you'll feel you have to say, things you must do and you can't do. Your freedom is clearly on the line here. But it, if you haven't been coerced, then the liberal story doesn't begin to approach these examples. And it seems to me that that's a radical weakness in the standard way of thinking about freedom. Well, uh, and this, Connects, of course, with the with, with this discussion, and I know that these are not uh, intellectuals that you uh, work with. But in the tradition of uh, uh, thinkers like Friedrich von Hayek, uh, oh. I think that is uh, uh, this lack of this, this this absence of coercion, the way that he uh, considers uh, society that that organizes. Uh, due to a price system and it's all about uh, voluntary uh, tra transactions about uh, with, with individuals so um yeah Kayuk is not uh, an, an individual that it's of course is deceased but it's not just an abstract figure it, it, it has uh, like a um, emblem of uh, conservative groups so I would like to know uh, under what tradition uh, would you place the, this thinker? That's a really interesting question. Um, von Hayek is a, an extremely unusual thinker. He looks like anyone else on the right wing, as we would say in Anglophone politics, somebody who dislikes the power of the state. He certainly dislikes the power of the state. And he very much wants state power decreased in the name of liberty. But in his great work, The Road to Serfdom, uh, what, 1942, he does not think of liberty as absence of coercion. It's not the coercive power of the state that worries him. His title tells you everything. What he's worried about is getting enslaved. That's to say, turning yourself into um, 
a subject of an arbitrary power. So it's the capacity of the state to make you subject to its will, which is what he dislikes. Uh, what he is pleading for is independence, not for non-coercion. He wants agents to be independent and independent above all of the state and dependence upon the state. He then has a lot of moralistic stuff about how dependence is bad for your moral fiber and so forth. But it is a very interesting instance of the way I'm talking about freedom used to ask questions about the state. So yes, he's, he's, um, he's a remarkable thinker. But where I would completely differ from him is that if you're going to take seriously the idea of liberating people from servitude, for example, to their employers or their partners, or, for example, the relationship of the poor states of the world to the rich states of the world as a condition of dependence, then you're going to have to have a very powerful state because the state is going to have to help people to liberate themselves from um, conditions in which they are uh, virtually enslaved or actually enslaved. Well, he, he was saying that uh, England or uh, the United States if they will go into this, well, it, it, it was the welfare state period, but he, yeah. called, he called it uh, socialism. And uh, if, the, if these nations will go into, the, uh, into this uh, journey, into this, uh, into this road, uh, it will be a totalitarian um, uh, state. And yes. that's not abstract. That 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 it's a, a really uh, concrete thought that never uh, realizes in the in the re real life. So that yes. that's the difficult that that's the difficult I have um, concerning Hayek because he is not a neo Roman. Is not a pre humanist. His thinking in the in the twentieth century with a with a state that is being uh, transformed and it has some uh, considerations about freedom that is uh, absence of coercion, uh, just giving some coercion to a con constitution and everything else is just uh, uh, the state um, just um, dip making a uh, just like noise into the price uh, system on a, on a coordination of individuals. So how do, do you see this conception of freedom in the context of the welfare state? How, how would you um, uh, uh, place uh, Frederick von Hayek in this uh, uh, historical uh, period? Well, I treat the establishment of the welfare state in England as a kind of refutation of Hayek. Uh, mm. the, the state that was established after 1945 was highly redistributionist. It was a socialist state, but it was not a totalitarian state. I mean, uh, you would have had to have been a very fierce right wing enemy of it in order to think that it was in the least totalitarian. It was attempting to draw large numbers of people out of poverty, dependence, subjection, and give them means to uh, live lives that were not quasi-slave lives. That was its aspiration. And it achieved that to an extraordinary degree. Uh, and that happened just in the years after Hayek was insisting that only a totalitarian state could do that. Of course, totalitarian, totalitarian states do do that, and the most extraordinary alleviation of um, poverty in the 20th century was the work of a state that you might think totalitarian, namely mainland China, uh, which um, performed an extraordinary social experiment of alleviating poverty and quasi-slave conditions. That, of course, was a great merit, um, but of a highly totalitarian state. But it doesn't have to be a totalitarian state that does it. It just has to be a state that's willing to re redistribute. Mm. But the liberal state is not willing to redistribute. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I, I understand that it, it's a, 
it's a uh, of course uh, re reality actually uh, refuted uh, Freddy for <laughs> Hayek. That's what I think. Yes, <laughs> yes but, I remember growing up to it and the establishment of um, free state health services and free schooling and free universities. Uh, the uh, opportunities that were given to people who'd never had these opportunities were extraordinary. Mm. That is really remarkable. But I would, I would like to go to another author that you uh, actually uh, studied quite a lot, that is Machiavelli. And he oh, wrote... Not the really with, <laughs> with the, but, but Machiavelli wrote the prince with the intention of being re recognized as a good citizen by the Medici. And I would like to know, uh, what can you tell us about this uh, background? Yes, you mean the historical background to, to that? Yes, 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 because the, yes. The, the motive of writing The Prince, that, 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 will, uh, so, that, that will be a certain surprise yes. for some people, is the, is the intention of being recognized um, as a good citizen by the, by the, yes. by the Medici. Yes, I would tend to say that he wrote more with the intention of showing the Medici, as he says at the end of the book, how to heal the wounds of Italy. Of course, I see what you mean about his wanting to be seen as a good citizen, because he wants the Medici to see him as someone whom it will be worthwhile to employ, not just as a good citizen, but a good advisor to them. But the book is a work of advice directed to the Medici. And as I say, at the end, he says, Italy needs its wounds to be healed. It, it needs... And then, the, I, this is never pointed out, but there's a wonderful pun there. The, it, it needs doctors. Now, the Italian word for doctors uh, is Medici. Uh, so course. he's saying we, we need the wounds to be healed by the Medici, by the doctors. And I can help you. I am the man to show you how to to heal the wounds of Italy. But just to say a word about the context of that, uh, this book was written in 1513, and 1513 was a great year of crisis in Machiavelli's life, um, and he was desperate for, for political employment. He had been uh, in the Republic that was overthrown in 1512. He had been the second chancellor of that Republic, very senior administrative position, and then when the French are removed from Italy by the forces of Spain, the French had been allies with the Florentines and the Florentine Republic collapses and the Medici, who had been exiled, um, return. And Machiavelli is then thrown out of power. He's accused of taking part in a conspiracy against them. He's imprisoned, he's tortured. Um, it's an appalling time for him. He's released uh, under amnesty uh, and he goes to his farm, which he'd inherited from his father, south of Florence, and he writes The Prince. And this is the book that he wants the Medici to read. He dedicates it to the princes. Um, very unusual dedication, because usually people would say to those prince, you know, I come before you with this worthless object, and he says, I come before you with this thing which you really need to read, and then you will know how, to wound, how the wounds can be bound up. Yes, but I, I, I would like to operationalize, or operationalize the notion of virtue and fortune. And b b beyond that, are those, are those concepts that are well used by Machiavelli useful, mm. say, for, politi for political science today, or are just ah. Well, that's very interesting. Um, they are the pivotal concepts in the book. The book is really about the contest between virtue and fortuna, And I do think, to answer your second question, that there are recognizable political forces that Machiavelli is talking about here. Fortuna, of course, Fortuna is the name of a Roman goddess. And she is the one who has, as he says, most temples dedicated to her because Fortuna is chance. And um, it names the unexpected things that happen just by luck, good luck or bad luck. Fortuna is both good luck and bad luck. And it's about unexpected opportunities and unexpected catastrophes. Um, now, virtu is the name of the quality that enables you to cope with fortuna. 
So that's the relationship. Um, by the way, there's a sexual metaphor here, which Machiavelli is very interested in. Fortuna is a goddess, so she's a woman. Fortuna e una donna, he says she's a woman. And so what does a woman want? <laughs> it's, it's a horrible metaphor, but she, she wants a real man, <laughs> uh, the manly man. Now, in Latin, there are two words for man, aren't there? There's homo, meaning man or woman, but there's also vir, meaning, in English, virile, the, the real man. And, of course, virtu is the quality of the vir. And so virtu confronts fortuna. And here, underlying all this, is a very famous remark in Livy's history of Rome. Fortuna fortes Uvac. Fort, and we say in English, it's a, it's a proverb with us, fortune favours the brave. Do you, do you have a similar saying? Fortune favours the brave. For, mm. Fortuna fortes ad uvac. So there's Machiavelli's thought. thought fortune favours the brave. Um, or as the Americans say, you can get lucky. And the way you can get lucky is to be a, a real veer, to have this quality of veer to seize your chances. And that's what Machiavelli says is the quality of virtue. Be bold. Well, one of the yes, last letters yes. that Machiavelli ever wrote, he, he says, I've been thinking about my life and I see that it is always better to act and have to repent than not to have acted. So, so there's virtue. It's, the quali it's an active quality of domination, of um, trying to seize your chance uh, and make fortune, make your fortune, as we say in English how to make your fortune, how to get rich or get powerful. Well, in, in, in a sense, there is this um, popular um, saying that is uh, being the right time at the right moment. In Spanish, it's, it's, in, the, it's in the same yes. way. Yes. Well, underlying this in Machiavelli is this ancient idea that there are two kinds of time. There's, there's time that passes, uh, tempus, um, but there's also what the Greeks had called kairos, and that is in timeliness, that, that's to say seizing the timely moment. And that's what Machiavelli is talking about. It is um, timeliness. Uh, and the man of virtu is the person who knows when to behave in a timely way. And if you know that really well, that brings good fortune. Yes, and that is uh, actually easy to see if you operationalize that those notions in, in, in th those ways. In an easy example, that is the pandemic of COVID-19. You have to have virtue and fortuna. Yeah, yeah. Yes, absolutely. Now, as I say, I think that we, we can see some of what he's talking about, especially this idea of timeliness. Yes. Yes, uh, and, and I, 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 agree, I agree with that. So, uh, in a last question that I have, it's about another author that you write a lot and you gave a lot of uh, lectures, and it's Hobbes. And uh, yeah. <laughs> you consider that he's not a, a republic of freedom, that he doesn't approach a republic of freedom, but a neo-Roman one. And... I would like to explore this particular argument. Well, I've written uh, a book about this. Uh, it's called Hobbes and Republican Liberty. And um, I think that's in Spanish. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, that's a book of 2007. And there I trace an evolution in Hobbes's thinking about freedom, because I think that in the Anglophone tradition, he is the pivotal figure. He writes three different works on politics, and the first was circulated in 1640 under the title The Elements of Law. He never published it, but he, he reworked it into his second book on politics, The De Kibe, 1642. Now, in The Elements of Law, he still is thinking in part in neo-Roman terms of liberty and subjection, because he thinks that the relationship of the citizen to the state is one of subjection to the will of the state. He completely changes his mind about that later because he changes his view of the state and he thinks the state is the name of a fictional person uh, and not simply the name of a power of government. 
But what above all he changes in his political theory is his understanding of liberty. Because by the time you come to his masterpiece, Leviathan, published in 1651, chapter 21 is called The Liberty of Subjects. And here he puts forward the claim that liberty is not being impeded. I think he is the first, he's certainly the first Anglophone philosopher who ever gave up the idea that the antonym of freedom is, sub is subjection and said straight off as a definition that the antonym of freedom is interference, Im impeding someone. I am unfree if you stop me from doing something. That's all that freedom means. Freedom is just not being impeded. And he, he goes even further. And, and has a very rigorous uh, analysis of the concept of freedom, which is to say, free, you're, you're, fr uh, you're free as long as you are not externally impeded. That's to say, an internal impediment might look like, for example, fear. Uh, so if I frighten you, if I coercively threaten you um, with some consequence if you don't do something, as a result of which you do it, have you acted freely? Well, most people would say, well, of course you haven't, because you've acted under coercion. Hobbes says, oh, no, no, you've acted freely. Because fear is not a restraint, it's a motive. And it's an expression of the will. And he takes the example in Aristotle of the man, it's in book four, I think, isn't it, of the politics, the, the man who throws his goods into the sea for fear the ship should sink. And Aristotle says, well, does he act freely? And he says, well, not altogether, um, because um, it wasn't his real choice to throw his goods into the sea. He had to do it. Hobbes says that's completely wrong. This is completely free action. He doesn't have to do it. He chooses to do it. Of course, he does it because he's frightened, but that's his motive for doing it. And so that whole discussion of whether coercion of the will takes away freedom is, is abolished in Hobbes. And he says... All of that is freedom. The only thing that produces unfreedom is if someone physically stops you from doing something. And that really altered the Anglophone tradition. So Hobbes is the pivotal figure. Freedom is non-interference. And, and that's gone right down through um, the liberal tradition of political philosophy. So for me, Hobbes is the pivotal figure and the reason why he was so interesting to me uh, as a theorist of political liberty. So you actually uh, would um, not uh, uh, place uh, Hobbes in the Republican or liberal tradition of uh, liberty as uh, absence of coercion? Not wholly. He's not a, in his mature statement of his political philosophy, he is the enemy of the Republican view that freedom is absence of subjection to someone's will. He doesn't think that that's what freedom is about. Freedom is just about whether you can do or not do an action. Don't talk about free persons. He says that that's a mistake to talk about free persons. Freedom is just about actions. And an action is free if it's not impeded. Now, that becomes, in Anglophone political philosophy, that becomes the way of thinking about freedom and remains so. If you think of the greatest work of analytical political theory in English of the last generation, John Rawls's theory of justice, there it is. It begins uh, by asking what is justice, and it answers justice is equal freedom, it's fairness. Um, and if you ask, well, but then what is freedom? The answer is non-interference. So the whole Hobbesian story has come through. What has not come through, of course, is this extremely rig rigorous view that freedom has to be absence of external impediments. Most people think psychological impediments take away freedom of action. But yes, Hobbes is the patron saint of the Anglophone liberal way of thinking about liberty. So he's my great enemy. <laughs> well, those are uh, strong statements. But <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for for your your time, Quentin. But before oh, no. you leave, before you leave, uh, as any scholar that is in this uh, program, I have to ask you a song to close this dialogue a song that you uh, that that you like or that you feel um, that it represents you in a way my goodness me it would have to be from classical music this song well you have to choose it 
You are free to choose it. Free to choose. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I don't think I can choose one, but I can tell you it would have to come from either Bach or Handel or Beethoven. I'll have to think further about which one it would be, but I'll leave you with the thought that it's going to come from one of those. Well, okay. So thank you, Quentin, for your time. Oh, thank and you. Thank you. Well, these have been really important questions for me, and it's enabled me to talk about a lot of my different books. So I'm extremely grateful. Thank you.